Miss Madison looked up at Ian, she seemed to notice a trace of suspicion in his eyes. Is he suspicious, or does he know the truth? She wondered. She knew that she wouldn't be able to hide the fact that she had recovered her memories for much longer. There was the constant worry that she would mention something from their past life together that only she and Ian knew, and of which she had not previously spoken. However, she still wanted to hide it for as long as she could, so that she would have more time with him. She even hoped that she might discover a way to overcome the looming impediment. Because of the risk of being found out, she was careful with her words and didn't speak unless it was necessary. She looked quietly at him and tried to get some clues from his expression. Ian wasn't entertaining suspicions. Instead, he was admiring the beauty that her subtle makeup was highlighting. Pink lips and clear eyes were too much of a temptation for him. A man who had been abstinent for five years, and he started to kiss her. The coats that they were holding fell to the floor at the same time, interweaving harmoniously and mirroring the two people getting along. Ian focused all his attention on the moment. Madison recovered from the shock of being kissed unexpectedly, and she tried to push him away. However, the difference in strength was too great, and she couldn't move him. She felt uncomfortable because she was afraid that someone would come in and see them. When she heard footsteps approaching, she was so anxious that she hit his chest hard. She wanted him to stop, but he didn't care at all, and her blows were ineffective. He hadn't kissed her many times since she had returned, and they had always been interrupted by someone. So he was determined not to be cut short again, and he was annoyed that Madison wasn't relaxed. She persisted in pushing him away, and he finally ended. Her face was red, and she was gasping for breath. The sound of footsteps was getting closer, so she bent down, picked up the coat she had dropped, and quickly left. Ian looked at her as she fled, and he smiled. He then noticed his coat on the floor with a shoe print on it, and laughed to himself. When Ian's assistant, Wayne, walked in and saw Ian looking so happy, he was alarmed. It's rumored that Mr. Weston has found his wife, and it must be true. Otherwise, why is he standing there looking so deliriously happy? It's not his usual demeanor, he thought. Mr. Weston, he called out before squatting down to help him pick up his coat. When he saw the shoe print on it, he felt that he had discovered some big secret. However, he concealed his thoughts. Mr. Weston, your coat is dirty. Do you want me to send it for dry cleaning? He asked. Ian grabbed his coat. There's no need for that. I'll see you at the meeting, he said. He headed toward the meeting room, holding his coat and displaying the obvious shoe print. It was as if he were showing off. Madison had already found a seat in the meeting room. Ian followed her in, with Wayne not far behind him. Once inside, Ian dropped his smile. However... It had already been spotted by all the attendees. He stood by his chair, and Wayne took advantage of the time before the start of the meeting to quickly distribute documents to the people gathered there. There were over 100 people in the huge meeting room, but it didn't seem crowded at all. Ian's eyes immediately picked out Madison, and she looked back at him. She seemed a little annoyed, and she held onto her coat tightly. Ian casually put his coat on the back of his chair and sat down. What happened to Miss Greenwald? Why is her face so red? He asked jokingly. Everyone in the room turned to look at Madison. When they saw that her face and lips were red, they were extremely curious about it. We've only just arrived here and Madison has already hooked up with someone. She's a fast worker, someone muttered. Suppressing her anger, Madison looked firmly at Ian. Thank you for your concern, Mr. Weston. My face is red because I was chased by a dog. I was just being friendly with it when it suddenly turned on me and pursued me. I didn't expect to meet such an implosive animal here. Hearing that there was a dog in the building, some of the girls who were afraid of dogs gasped, and there were several comments. I don't like dogs. I hope I don't run into it. If you do, don't let it know that you're afraid. As long as you stay calm, you'll be okay. Ian smiled at her clever explanation. While staring at her, 
He spoke to Wayne. Go and find out who brought a dog into the building. Also, I was scratched by a cat today. So while you're at it, find out where that is, too, he ordered. It was the first time that Wayne had received such a strange order, and he was shocked. He looked at Madison before leaving to carry out Ian's ridiculous command. Although some of the smarter people in the room had seen through the performance, some people believed that a dangerous dog and a cat were running around the place, and they would need to take care when leaving the building. Madison stared at Ian as he raised his eyebrows. He then flipped open the document in front of him before beginning to talk frankly and confidently. His authoritative yet relaxed manner was very attractive to many of the people there. Almost half of the women in the room didn't take in what he was saying, because they were lost in admiration for his style and looks. Lastly, let me remind everyone of something important, he said as he closed the document and looked coldly at the people in the room. There will be four matches in a month, and the final competition will be held here during the fifth week. Most of you will be eliminated in the first three weeks. Only ten people will be left in the fourth week, and only two will go through to the final, he said. As he finished, he raised two fingers. His simple action was designed to heighten the feeling of competition. Standing up, he buttoned up his jacket. Everyone, take care, he said as he picked up his coat and left the meeting room. The relaxed atmosphere in the room had changed. They now knew that many of them would soon be eliminated, and after three weeks, there would only be ten left. With only two spots in the finals, they were all clear that to participate in the Tate Awards, they would have to clear a lot of hurdles, and the competition would be fierce from the beginning. It was still early when Madison came out of the Weston Group's building, as she did, she saw a few people walking past her. A young father lifted his son onto his shoulders. The two of them were shouting as the father ran through the snow. A young mother was watching them from behind, and she looked happy and content under the soft sunlight. Did Sophia also have such a beautiful childhood? She wondered. Although she had regained her memories, Sophia's past was still unknown to her. Madison thought about wanting to see the child. She got into a taxi, but she didn't know where she was going. She remembered the night when she had been on a video call with Ian and had seen Sophia's uniform next to him. She knew the name of Sophia's school. Sophia's kindergarten was the best in the city. Whether it was in terms of teaching standards, equipment, or facilities, no other school came close. The city's wealthy families sent their next generation there to be nurtured. When she arrived at the entrance of the school, a security guard walked over to challenge her. May I ask who you're looking for? He asked as he eyed her up suspiciously. She didn't know what to say for a moment. She had gone there purely on impulse, and no one there even knew her. Even her daughter, Sophia, didn't know her. In the schoolyard, the children were playing games, they were all wearing the same school uniform, so it was hard to tell which one of them was Sophia. They were also so far away that it was hard to see their faces. Some of the other parents walked into the school to pick up their children. Madison, however, stood where she was and couldn't move at all. She had been separated from her child for five years, and she suspected that even if she saw her now, she wouldn't be able to recognize her. She felt very uncomfortable and began to think that she had made a mistake by going there. The guard saw that Madison seemed out of place there, but he couldn't be sure that she didn't have a legitimate reason for being there. While not wanting to offend her, he also considered whether he should call the police. Madison tried her best to control her emotions. She looked at the schoolyard from afar and smiled apologetically at the guard before turning around and leaving. As she left... Her footsteps were unsteady. I don't know why I came here. I expect that Sophia would be disgusted with a mother like me, she thought. Sophia, who had been sitting on a bench next to some railings and looking out in boredom, had seen Madison with her sharp eyes. The children beside her were surprised because it was very rare to see Sophia so excited at school.
When Madison looked like she was about to leave, Sophia became anxious and got up from her seat. Her head accidentally hit the railings, and the pain from the impact made her grimace. But she still opened her teary eyes to look at the woman who was walking away. Mommy, she muttered. Without even paying attention to the bump on her head, Sophia took out a picture from her small purse. Three different pictures had been torn and pasted together to make it. There was a young and handsome daddy, a smiling Sophia, and a beautiful mommy. Everyone else had their mommy, and so did she. It was just that she didn't know where she was, and she didn't know whether she would come back or not. She had often secretly looked at her family portrait while wishing for her to return. Has my mommy come back? She wondered. She burst into tears, muttered some words that couldn't be heard clearly, and stubbornly looked in the direction where Madison had been. Her friends were concerned by her tears, Thinking that she had hurt herself, some of them ran to find her teacher. When little Cooper heard the news that Sophia had been injured, he went over to see her. Although he was younger than Sophia by a year, he was mature to the point of leaving people speechless. Sophia, what happened to you? Where does it hurt? He asked, sounding very worried. In his eyes, Sophia was just like his sister. Sophia didn't answer him. She just looked in the direction Madison had gone and cried inconsolably. Her sobbing scared the teacher because she didn't know the reason for it. Sophia was usually independent and rarely cried, so the teacher was afraid that it was something serious. After seeing a mark on the child's forehead, she arranged for her to be taken to the hospital and contacted Ian. When the teacher took Sophia inside the school, she was unable to console her and the little girl just kept crying. Before long, her eyes were swollen from crying, and they looked quite alarming. The teacher was worried that she might be accused of being negligent by allowing Sophia to get injured. Cooper comforted Sophia and gave her some candy before returning to his classroom. After receiving the call from the teacher, Ian was even more anxious. He threw down his work and headed to the hospital. Why is Sophia upset? It's not like her to cry like that, he thought. In the hospital, Sophia didn't speak, but just kept crying. After sobbing for a long time, her voice became weak, but her tears kept falling. The doctor looked at her forehead, but he didn't think it was the cause of her distress. When Ian arrived at the hospital and saw his daughter so upset, he felt his heart tightening. Seeing her father appear... Sophia jumped off the bed and ran toward him. Her crying became louder and louder. Daddy! Daddy! She called out. The little child's cry made people feel very sad. The TV screen in the waiting area was showing an interview with Ian from a few days earlier. When they saw it, several of the nurses realized Sophia's identity, and they wanted to use the girl to get close to Ian. Ian squatted and hugged his daughter. The moment she entered his arms, she told him the reason for her tears. Daddy, I saw Mommy. Mommy's back, she said. Why didn't she come into the school and see me? Doesn't she want me anymore? As her questions poured out, the people listening were intrigued. Ian was dumbfounded as he looked at his daughter. Her cheeks were red from crying, and there was a lump on her forehead, which was quite noticeable. However, Sophia didn't care about the lump. She just kept asking about her mother, and it was clear to Ian that her distress was connected with Madison. Daddy, I saw Mommy, she repeated. Why didn't she come in to find me? Is she angry with me? Sophia was very sensitive. Most of the other children at the school had mothers, but she only had a father. It had never bothered her before, but more recently she had started to feel different from the others, and had begun to wonder where her mommy was. Ian had only told her that her mother was angry with him, and that she had gone abroad, assuring her that when her mother's anger subsided, she would come back. However, Sophia had been waiting since she was two years old, and she had become more aware of her mother's absence, and more eager for her return. Daddy, I miss mommy, she said. 
Sophia had patiently waited for her mother to return, but now that she had seen her walk away, her sorrow had become too much for her to bear. Ian looked carefully at the bump on her forehead and was relieved to hear from the doctor that it wasn't serious. He pulled his daughter into his arms. Where did you see mommy? And how did you know that it was her? He asked. Only then did she stop crying. She took out the purse that was given to her by Cassandra, but which had no money in it, and pulled out the family portrait that she had pieced together. Seeing it, Ian could hardly hold back his tears. Daddy, this is mommy, right? She nervously asked, afraid that her father would get angry about her having the picture. Can you bring her back? I want her with me. She held out the worn-out photo, which had been crudely stuck together and was Sophia's handiwork. Ian didn't know when she had made it, but judging by the degree of wear and tear, he could see that she had handled it many times. His heart ached at the thought of her looking at it and missing her mother. At that moment, he wanted to give Madison a good dressing down for not being with her daughter. Doesn't she feel any heartache? He wondered. However, he felt heartache for both of them. He hugged his daughter tightly and gave her some reassurance. Sophia, let's go home now. Mommy is very busy right now. After she's finished her work, she'll come and see you in a few days, he promised. She stopped crying and didn't speak, but tightly grabbed Ian's clothes and was unwilling to continue waiting. He sighed, picked her up, and walked out with her. When they arrived home, Sophia was still pouting and feeling aggrieved. Her hands were tightly wrapped around Ian's neck, and she was unwilling to let go. He hugged her, and they sat on the couch together. She was still holding the picture while looking up at him expectantly. As he looked at her, he knew what his mission was. He was a husband and a father, and he wanted to support both Madison and Sophia. When Madison hadn't been around, he had looked for her while taking care of Sophia. Now that Madison was back, his life could be perfect, and he had to ensure that happened. He took out a tissue and gently wiped the tears from his daughter's face. Sophia, do you miss your mommy? He asked. He had never hidden the fact that Madison existed, but he had always tried to explain the situation to Sophia in a way that she could understand. Do you still miss her? She asked in reply. He looked again at the picture in Sophia's hand and felt heartache. His child's longing for a complete family was more intense than he had imagined. He nodded, and Sophia made herself more comfortable in his arms, still clinging tightly to his shirt. Yes, I miss Mommy too, and I want her to be with us. I want all of us to be together, she said. As she spoke, her teary eyes were full of expectation. You said that Mommy will come back. Now that she's back... Can't you bring her to see me? Is she still angry with you? She asked. He was stumped by Sophia's questions. If I could bring her here, would I still feel so aggrieved? He wondered. Sophia tugged at his shirt and gave him a suggestion. If mommy is still angry with you, then I'll help you to be friends again. I can talk to mommy and make her your friend. She offered. Ian looked at the earnestness on his daughter's face and he couldn't help but laugh. She wanted to meet Madison and act as a peacemaker. He patted her head. Thank you for that, Sophia. But I'm the one who needs to make her come back, he said. It was late at night and Madison had just walked out of the bathroom when someone knocked on her door. She thought it was room service, so she opened the door, but was surprised to see Allie and Cooper standing there. Did I disturb you? Allie asked. Before meeting up again recently, they hadn't seen each other for several years, and they had become unfamiliar with each other. Allie glanced down at Cooper. Cooper said that he wanted to tell you something. We happened to be nearby, so we came over, she explained. Madison didn't know anything about Allie's life over the previous five years. Before, she had been a lively girl, but now she appeared to be calmer and quieter. 
Madison stood back to let them in. She was intrigued by the visit, but at the same time she was slightly uncomfortable. She knew that she used Allie when she had left Ian, and that Allie was aware that she had regained her memory. This meant that Allie had some leverage over her. Allie took Cooper in and stood by his side. She let go of his hand and gestured for him to speak to Madison. Just as when she had seen him before, he was brimming with confidence, and he gave Madison a big smile. Auntie Madison? Sophia bumped into the railings at school today. There was a big lump on her forehead, and she cried a lot, he said. When she heard Cooper talking about Sophia, Madison grew nervous, and she held his shoulder. Why did she hit her head? Was it serious? Did she go see a doctor? Does her daddy know? She asked anxiously. Cooper was taken back by the barrage of questions, but he soon recovered. He put his hands behind his back and tilted his head slightly. I thought you didn't want Sophia anymore. She's been waiting for you to come back, he said. Hearing this, Madison felt hot tears filling her eyes. She didn't know what to say to him. Allie sighed and held Madison's hand. I don't care why you want to hide the fact that you've recovered your memory. You don't want to tell me, and I won't force you. But I just want to say that Sophia hasn't had a mother for the past five years. She knows you exist, and she's been waiting for you for her whole life. Just like her father, she wants you back, Allie said. Thank you for telling me, but I need to be alone now, Madison said curtly. After sending Allie and Cooper away... She held her phone as she anxiously paced around the room. Should I call Ian and ask him? She wondered. She had motherly feelings toward her child, and she was concerned that Sophia had hit her head. While Madison was hesitating, Ian was waiting in his study for her call. It didn't come, but someone else rang. When he saw who it was, Ian didn't want to answer it, but the caller was very persistent and kept ringing back. Finally... Ian picked up in anger. Hades, why are you calling me so late? Can it wait for another time? He snapped. He was very angry because Hades had taken Madison and caused her to have an accident. However, he had only told him about it five years after the event. If he had known earlier, he might have brought Madison back much sooner instead of waiting foolishly for so many years. I don't want to talk to you right now, he hissed. Hades wasn't bothered by Ian's outburst. He waited for him to finish before giving the reason for his call. Mr. Weston, it's about the matter I entrusted to you when we last spoke. How's it going? He asked. Ian took a deep breath. I'm still investigating, he replied. Hades frowned. He hadn't expected Ian to be investigating the matter for so long, but he didn't let his impatience come through in his voice. Thank you for updating me, he said. At that point, Ian wanted to end the call, but Hades continued. By the way, I wonder what you think of Sue now. Do you want to discuss it with me? Ian bristled at the mention of her name. He looked at a drawer and pulled it open. Inside was a wedding photo of him and Madison, alongside a copy of their divorce agreement. In the photo, Madison was brimming with youth and her smile had a hint of shyness. He caressed Madison's cheek and asked, What do you mean by that? You're making me very suspicious. Sue is one of my people. She's just a subordinate of mine, Hades said. She's been very useful to me, which is why I've kept her on my side. Now that I have you to help me, I'm just reconsidering whether I should continue to keep her. Hades quietly waited for Ian's reply and didn't seem to be in a hurry. After a long hesitation, Ian gave his answer. Send her away. The further, the better. Madison and I don't want to see her again, he growled. Madison doesn't need a mother who is so heartless and who has never treated her as a daughter, he thought. With a slight raise of his eyebrows, Hades said, Okay, I'll do as you ask. But I need you to move more quickly on what we discussed the last time we spoke. When you finish your investigation, perhaps I'll be able to help you some more. He was deliberately vague, but Ian understood what he meant. 
What Ian needed the most right then was Madison. Even so, he didn't choose to trust Hades. After ending the call and putting away his phone, the study fell silent. Ian sat in his chair deep in thought. The thing that Hades had asked him to do was not a small matter, and he could tell that the man was becoming impatient. The next day, Ian got up early so that he could take Sophia to school. After putting on her uniform, she ran over to him with her hair hanging loosely and sat down in front of him. Ian put down his newspaper, took a small comb from her, and began to skillfully tidy up her hair. He tied a neat ponytail and even fixed the big bow knot that she had picked out for herself. By the time he had finished with her, she looked very presentable. Carrying her small school bag, Sophia had a smile on her face as she walked out to her father's car. Ian was surprised by how much her mood had changed since the previous day. Why are you so happy? I didn't know that you liked school so much, he said. Sophia smiled as she climbed into her seat. While they drove to school, she straightened up her clothes. Daddy, do you think I'm pretty today? She asked. Of course you are, he replied. If mommy comes to school, will she recognize me because I'm beautiful like her? She asked. Ian looked at her in the rear view mirror. No matter what you look like, mommy will recognize you at first glance because you're her daughter, he said. She smiled even more when she heard that and started to hum a tune. When Ian's car neared the school, there were already many other cars there. He parked as close to the school as possible and helped Sophia out. The two of them walked happily toward the school entrance. Along the way, Sophia greeted her classmates with a smile. Sophia! Someone called in a warm, gentle voice. When Ian and Sophia looked back, they saw Anika, who was wearing the same school uniform as Sophia, and standing next to Shane while smiling shyly. Shane remained beside his daughter and waited for Ian and Sophia to walk over. When Sophia saw Anika, she also smiled, and she broke free from Ian's hand and ran over to her. Ian slowly walked over, keeping his eyes fixed on Shane. The first person to find Madison had been Shane, but he had kept her hidden. Two years later, Zack had also found her, and he too had hidden her away. It was only after five years that Ian found her. If it hadn't been for Madison's feelings, Ian would have taught both of them a lesson. While they had known Madison's whereabouts, he had been left like a fool, crazily using various methods to try to find her. As soon as he took a deep breath, Ian thought of the phone call from the previous night. Anika and Sophia talked nonstop from the moment they met, and the way they held hands was adorable. Ian and Shane stood side by side at the school entrance. Seeing their daughters waving at them and walking into school, they both smiled. I heard that Interpol hasn't been very busy for a while. Why don't you do me a favor? Ian asked. Shane was surprised by the request and wasn't sure what Ian was suggesting. Shane looked suspiciously at Ian, but Ian didn't care what he was thinking, and he calmly turned around and started to walk away. After taking a couple of steps, he stopped and turned back to face Shane. About the things you did behind my sister's back, yesterday, I accidentally sent her an email, Ian said. Shane's expression turned dark, but Ian just smiled and continued on his way. He didn't seem to care about the Crawford family. Anika was four years old, and Cassandra had become Shane's fiance. She lived with the Crawford family and was treated as their daughter-in-law. When Madison left, Allie wasn't the only one who had found out that she was unexpectedly pregnant. Cassandra had discovered the same thing. Ian got into his car and drove quickly to his workplace. That day was the day that the first assignments in the Westing Group's advertising competition were to be allocated. Over the following seven days, the participants had to make the best advertisement they could, and it had to be carefully targeted. After a week, they would be expected to deliver a finished advertisement. 
To reach the final stage, they would undergo a thorough test of their abilities in design and communication, as well as having to prove their market awareness. When Ian arrived at the meeting room on the 32nd floor, everyone was there, including Madison, who looked like she hadn't slept well the previous night. She had put on some light makeup, but it was obvious that she wasn't at her best. Ian raised his eyebrows slightly, but he pretended not to have seen her. He ordered his assistant, Wayne, to distribute the relevant documents. There are five themes in total. They are shampoos, facial masks, clothes, shoes, and medical supplies, Ian said. He was much more matter-of-fact in his manner than he had been when he was a surgeon at Mercy Hospital. He continued, Twenty people will be assigned to each topic. You need to get the finished advertisements to me by next Monday, and I will choose the winner on the spot. You can decide for yourselves how to approach the task, and I won't interfere. But the final decision rests with me. If any of you think that you're not up to the task, you can leave now. I'll be a fair judge, and those who show the most outstanding ability will proceed to the next stage. Your work must be original, and it must be your own. Don't think that I won't notice if you try to pass off someone else's work as yours. His eyes were filled with coldness as his warning gaze swept over all the people present. Madison looked up at him, but she didn't show any reaction. She was still worried about Sophia's injury. She had been in a dilemma for the whole of the previous night, and she had hardly slept. In the end, she hadn't called Ian, but she still wanted to know that Sophia was okay. The fact that Ian was at the meeting told her that he was confident enough about his daughter's condition that he was prepared to leave her, and that gave Madison some comfort. The meeting didn't last long. Once Ian announced that it was over, everyone rushed over to Wayne to choose their topic. Only Madison remained in her seat without moving. At that moment, she didn't care about the advertisement at all. She only wanted to know how her daughter was doing. Ian sat at the conference table. His commanding appearance attracted the attention of several women, who glanced furtively at him as they waited to speak to Wayne. After they were allocated topics, they left the room unwillingly. Before leaving, some of them muttered to each other about wishing they hadn't been so enthusiastic to get their topics. If they had stayed until the end like Madison, they might have gotten the opportunity to speak to Ian. When there were only three people left in the meeting room, Madison roused herself. She quickly got up and stood in front of Wayne to confirm her assignment. The only thing left was the most unpopular topic, which was medical supplies. It wasn't a sexy product, so it would be more challenging to make a compelling advertisement. Wayne looked at Ian for guidance, but didn't receive any reaction. So he could only clench his teeth and confirm the assignment with Madison. Then he quickly found an excuse and left the room. With Wayne gone, only Madison and Ian were left in the meeting room. Madison was wearing a camel coat, and her hair was casually pulled to one side, making her look both charming and flirtatious. Ian just sat casually at the conference table with his legs crossed, holding the cup of coffee. Miss Greenwald, is there anything else? He asked in a very natural and unrestrained manner, even though he knew the answer. Madison felt apprehensive. She wanted to ask about Sophia's situation, but she didn't know how to raise the subject. She took a deep breath and was about to speak when Ian beat her to it. Your assignment is medical supplies. Have you thought about what you'll do? He asked casually as he played with the cup. After a slight hesitation, her brain came back into operation. The scope of the topic was very large, and the only way that she would be able to proceed with it was if she focused on one product. She needs to quickly decide on a product and then build the advertisement around it. Almost without thinking, she opened her mouth and said, Stethoscopes. Ian stopped playing with the cup, and his eyes grew deep and distant. He was a doctor himself, and he knew what a stethoscope meant to a doctor. Putting down the cup, he stood up and started to walk out. Not bad, he said as he opened the door. Madison looked at him and started to panic. 
She hadn't become stronger or more capable after her five years away. On the contrary, she was even less confident than she had been in the past. She had tried to become strong, but the effect was minimal. Before she had time to think, she said, Mr. Weston. Ian turned around to look at her. He had one hand in his pocket and looked very handsome and relaxed. She took a deep breath and said, Mr. Weston, let me treat you to a meal. I want to ask your opinion on this advertisement. You're also a doctor, aren't you? He didn't answer, and her heart almost jumped into her mouth, because she was afraid that he would reject her. After leaving her dangling for a while, he gave his answer. I'll pick you up at 7 o'clock, and I'll decide where we'll go, he said. Madison felt a wave of relief, and she was able to breathe again. Ian walked out of the room, leaving her alone and trembling. How will I be able to get news of Sophia from him? Maybe I should just suggest that he brings her with him, she thought. Outside the meeting room, Ian emitted an aura of being unapproachable as he strode down the corridor. Madison, as you want some help, I'll help you. I'll give you what you want, and you can also give me what I want, he thought. It was mid-afternoon when someone knocked on the door of Madison's room at the Pink Star Hotel. She had just washed her hair, and her top was slightly wet and transparent due to the water. So she put on a bathrobe before going to see who was there. It was her brother, Bruce. She had never felt any resentment toward him. She only felt sadness. Compared to her, Bruce hadn't had a good life when he was young. Bruce had only found out about Madison's return that day, and before he had even finished his work, he had headed over to see her. As soon as she opened the door, he couldn't control his emotions, and he reached out and held her in his arms. Almost immediately, the scene changed. Suddenly, there were reporters everywhere, and many of them were holding cameras. The corridor had erupted into chaos. Some of the reporters shouted out questions. Bruce, what's your relationship with this young lady? Your new movie is about to be released. Aren't you afraid that a scandal will affect it at the box office? Does Zola know about this? Bruce, how long have you two guys been together? Do you plan to get married? Madison was shocked when she heard the questions and saw the flashing lights around her. Bruce quickly recovered from the shock, took off his long jacket and threw it over Madison so that no one would take a clear picture of her. Fortunately for her, the reporters hadn't seen her face at all. They had only seen that she was wearing a bathrobe. Miss, may I ask your name? Are you the third person in Bruce's relationship? How long have you two been together? Aren't you afraid that exposing your relationship with Bruce will affect his career? Can you confirm that you're his mistress? In just a few minutes, the news of the popular actor having a mistress spread across the city. In Francis' office, Ian was staring at a screen that was showing the news. He rubbed his chin and looked increasingly angry as he listened to the reporters firing off questions. Francis stood at his side, realizing how angry the broadcast would make his boss and wishing that he were anywhere but in his office. Why did Mr. Weston have to come to my office right at the moment this news was showing? It would have been much better if I'd broken it to him gently, he thought. Mr. Weston, what should we do? Should we try to block all the follow-up news? Francis asked. Things had already gotten out of hand, and with Bruce's fame, the rapid spread of the news was inevitable. Ian gave Francis an irritated glance. It's already too late for that, he growled. Francis, did you see the news? Paul blurted as he peered at the door. He was panting after running to tell Francis the news about Bruce and Madison. When I was watching the news, I was thinking that Mr. Weston will probably be going demented. I hope he doesn't take it out on us again, as I was hoping for an early finish today. He continued without even looking up. When Paul finally stepped into the office and saw Ian there, his face turned red, 
and he looked down at the floor awkwardly. Ian raised his eyebrows slightly and smiled as he leaned back in his chair, looking carefully at Paul. Francis felt sorry for his colleague. Paul would often grumble to him about the amount of work that Ian gave them and how some of their tasks seemed pointless because there was only a remote chance of them being successful. However, Francis knew that Paul would always give the work 100% of his effort and would do anything for Ian. Paul swallowed hard and stood stiffly while waiting for Ian to speak. Do I take it out on you? Ian asked, using Paul's words. Francis and Paul were so scared that they didn't even dare to breathe. Maybe I've been too hard on you for the past years. Would you like it if I gave you something easier? Paul wished that he hadn't been so excited by the news and had taken more care before speaking. He didn't know what to say in answer to Ian's question. Ian was just about to speak again when his phone rang. He glanced at it and saw that it was Bruce. So without any hesitation, he picked it up and walked out. Did you see the news? Bruce asked. His voice was full of anxiety because he was concerned about Ian's reaction. If it hadn't been for Ian's help, Bruce might not have reached his current position. Ian had recognized Bruce as his brother-in-law and had helped him and protected him. Bruce's visit to Madison had been spontaneous, so he hadn't realized that he had been set up. I saw it and you needn't worry because I'll deal with it, Ian said as he got into his car. Francis and Paul followed him into the car but didn't dare to disturb him. Tell your sister to get ready. I'll pick her up at six o'clock. After saying that, he hung up without giving Bruce a chance to speak. Paul didn't understand what Ian was trying to do. Francis, on the other hand, understood his boss better than Paul, and he looked at Ian in disbelief before driving away. When they arrived at their destination, Ian got out of the car. Paul, I want you to follow me this afternoon, he said. His words indicated that something big was going to happen that afternoon, and Paul quickly got out of the car and followed his boss. Francis returned to his office and remained on call. Bruce arrived back at the Pink Star Hotel and went straight up to Madison's room. He was feeling very anxious because he hadn't expected that he would get her involved in a media storm by visiting her. The last thing he wanted to do was to involve his sister in a stressful situation, and he felt that he had been an idiot. I'm sorry, he said sheepishly. Madison was annoyed too, but she also knew that it couldn't be blamed on Bruce. He wasn't to know that the reporters would be lying in ambush. It's okay, don't worry about it. I'm sure it'll be fine and that it can be sorted out, she said. However, she was afraid that her appearance would become a ticking time bomb and that she might accidentally destroy Bruce's career. Madison was also afraid that she might harm Ian's reputation. She didn't think that she was a strong person and she didn't know how she was going to deal with the media attention. In her eyes, she was just an ordinary woman who had her dreams and fantasies. She was a woman who was prepared to work hard and wanted to protect the life she thought was right for her. But now, she felt that things had become very difficult. Bruce was also anxious, but he had matured quite a bit, and he knew that he had Ian on his side. So he felt the situation was still retrievable. He held his sister's hand and tried to comfort her. You've recovered your memory, haven't you? He said. She looked straight at him, but didn't say anything. Bruce smiled, and his eyes were filled with warmth. I've known since I was a child that I had an elder sister. But it wasn't Sue who told me. I found it out from Hades. He said that I had an elder sister who was gentle, kind, and beautiful. When I was young, I found out that you were in the city. So I walked all the way here hoping that I might find you. Madison looked at him and felt warmth and appreciation toward him. She liked Bruce from the bottom of her heart, and she could see that his whole body was filled with positive energy. Although he had occasionally been a bit wild, he had never done anything immoral. Moreover, he had always taken her side no matter what. This made her feel genuinely loved, which was comforting for her after having lived for five years without being able to feel that she could trust anyone. 
As he thought about the past, Bruce gave a wistful smile. I struggled to survive at the bottom of society, but I knew that my sister lived well among the wealthy. It makes me happy to know that as long as I have a sister, I have a family. I'm so happy that we can finally meet as brother and sister. As he spoke, Bruce became very emotional. As a child, he had been denied warmth. He hadn't received any maternal love or known the love of a father for his son. His elder sister Kate had never cared about him, but he had always imagined what it would be like to have a caring older sister. Coincidentally, Madison was very similar to the elder sister he had imagined. She was kind and gentle, and she liked him. Do you know how I felt when I found out that you knew about your origins? I wondered if you would hate me and not care about me anymore. But even at that time, you didn't show any disgust toward me. Because of my identity as a public figure, it wasn't easy to look for you openly, so I had to be careful. I was ecstatic when Ian told me that you were staying in this hotel, so I ran over here without a care. Madison smiled, and I was pleased to see you as soon as I opened the door. I was just as shocked as you were by the reporters. Bruce started to look serious. You were gone for five years, and that was tough for me, he said. Madison's eyes filled with tears. Bruce was the same kind of person as her. The two of them had experienced a lack of warmth in their lives and needed to get that warmth from each other. They needed to be together. She reached out and pulled him into her arms. Sorry, I didn't do it on purpose. I lost my memory, she cried. Someone knocked on the door and Bruce lifted his head from her arms and wiped the tears from her face. He finally had family and he would never abandon her because their bodies flowed with the same blood. Madison saw that he was overwhelmed and she smiled at him. For a few moments, she had forgotten about what was happening outside. However, the knock on the door brought her back to reality. Although Bruce was with her again, she didn't think that it was a reporter because the hotel management had put up barriers outside the hotel, and only people with legitimate business at the hotel were allowed to enter. She opened the door, but didn't recognize the man standing there. Bruce looked over and saw that it was his PR manager. It's okay, he's with me, so you can let him in, Madison, he said reassuringly. Because Madison was looking nervously at the man as he walked in, Bruce explained to her that he was his PR manager. The man nodded formally to Madison. He was dressed in an expensive suit and looked very professional. Mr. Quinn, based on what's happening outside, there are only two ways we can go, he said coldly. The first way is to admit that you and Miss Greenwald are a couple. At the same time, you will deny that there is a relationship between you and Zola. That way, the story of you being here will become a false alarm. The second way is for you to confess that you are brother and sister and... No. Before the second solution could be explained fully, Madison stopped him. No. Bruce feels that he can't get involved with a sister who would cause him a lot of trouble. She said firmly. The atmosphere in the room became tense.